How's it going, everyone? My name is Cynical, and welcome back to Higurashi When They Cry. We are finally here, entering chapter 8. Ooh, I am excited to finally finish this. Not in the wrong sense, but in the good sense. <laughs> I'm not excited to get this done and over with. I'm actually, I will be sad when this is all over. But I'm actually excited to be here, enjoying this, as well as I hope all of you are about ready as I am to get right in into chapter 8. Matsuri Bayashi. Let's go ahead and start this. So real quick, go ahead and give the rundown of the settings that I have. For character sprites, I have it left on Remake. Uh, language is obviously English. And um, that's about it. I'm going to be messing with the volumes once we get into it. Because I don't know what they sound like as of now. I tried my best to recreate it to how everything in the past the chapters have been. So I don't know what's loud, what's not. So first... 10 to 20 minutes, I'll be messing with the audio settings. Sorry, but it has to be done. But let's start, shall we? Ooh, yes, that chirping sound, baby. Let's go. At least he let it end with a blissful dream. Festival accompanying chapter. The riddle you have been entrusted with solving now finally becomes unraveled. What must be done to stop the chain? And what will happen in the ultimate end? It's a showdown between the conclusion you reached and the one I reached. There's no difficulty. You should understand that now. I do, baby. I do. Let's go, baby. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. Oh, there's that name right there. Burnkestel. <laughs> God damn it. I'm not going to go ahead and read this because I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be able to finish it. But there you go. Pause and read if you like to read out this little poem type thing. Uh, this is a work of fiction, obviously. Oh. Okay. Text box could be a little bit darker. Let's get that out of the way as well. All right. Perfect. All right. The study was filled with piles of books and papers. So far, the music sounds okay. That's great. That's great. Hopefully, the voices won't blare my eardrums. <laughs> In that study, there was a full-figured old man writing something at his desk in utmost concentration. There was also a little girl sorting out papers on the carpet. She almost looked as though she was playing with them. But the serious expression she was wearing made it clear that she wasn't. Alright. Ah, that's why we have these here. Alright. Voice needs to go up higher. Hmm. Maybe right here. All right, let's try that out. Miyoko. <laughs> Ifumi. Okay, I remember. But this is very weird. I have increased that volume quite a bit. Why is it not? That's weird. Maybe now? Maybe lower the music just a tad. Maybe that will help it. Just a tad. Right there. Okay. Yep, yeah, that's good. That's good. Hopefully you all agree. If you don't, let me know. Sensation 
人間が人間らしくあることを司る部分だよねそうだ人の感情は心が生み出すのではない脳という名の器官が分泌物を生み出して与える副産物に過ぎその脳に特定の干渉をするナノ単位の生命体の集合が存在しある命令系統を持つ一つのコロニーに関与したならば。So are parasites the cause of the spread of ideology? When、uh, ideologies clash, is that because different parasites are competing to expand their habitats? あるいは教育の分布か国境の分布か人種の分布か、hmm. 我々の世界の異なる文化コミュニティの存在とその対立の一因はそういった人の思想に影響を及ぼす微細な生命体の存在にあると仮定しているおじいちゃんと同じことを考えている人が外国にもいたんだねもちろんいるとも。可視不可視を問わず、地球上には無数の生命体がいて、その中には宿主の体内に潜伏して共存し、時には宿主を支配したりすることが広く知られている。Indeed, and the ones that do control their hosts, scary as shit, alright? <laughs> God damn. そして実際に。人体内にその存在をたくさん発見してもいる<笑>にもかかわらず人体に潜伏しその宿主を支配する生命体の存在についてはかたくなに否定してきた家庭すらも含めてなどうしてだろうね人間だけ特別な存在のわけはないのに True それを仮定することはすなわち、意思に基づいた言動や信念を疫学的原因から派生したものと置き換えられて、対処策もそれと同様とみなされる危険があるからだ。If conflicts in ideology can be resolved through debate, then they are peaceful. But if those conflicts occur epidemically, They become frightening. And if one were to treat bad thoughts or the spread of culture as an epidemic, Hmm. そのまま病院で死んでしまうこともある。Which made things hundreds of times worse. すると、その死体は焦燥となる。That didn't happen until later in the years, right? They figured they had to burn the corpses. さらに、患者が触れたものまで衛生のため、すべて没収して焼き捨てる。Right, right. 身近の家族にも感染の疑いがあるから、強制的に入院させねばならん。Fourteen, baby. I wonder why some of these lines aren't. Hmm. Don't know if it's intentionally because of a reason or not. Don't know if it's a glitch, but anyway. So, did hospitalize healthy people over individual ideas? Well, they have to, just in case. Can't take the risks, right? <laughs> The rest is the same. Can't she see my dead tie in such a night? Could it a mono a cancel no tie in a look at a subit the yaki still? Kazokuni mo cancel no tie in a look at a kyose nui. Demo, she saw nante cozy no ji yun on the show. Best to a chiga. If an idea was created by parasites, it would be exactly the same as a plague. So you mean 
Anyone with a different idea is treated like they have a disease. そういうことだ。この考えを延長すると無差別、そして無秩序な大量虐殺が起こる。そうすると人類は大規模な粛清を肯定してしまう論調になりかね。だから脳内で宿主を支配する生命体を語ることは今の時代ではタブーになっているの
That was such a cruel thing to say, but I didn't mean to be cruel. I had to see how hard my grandfather had been working, and I also knew he wouldn't live forever. I just wanted his work to gain recognition. Recognition. There we go. <laughs> Before he died. Do you know of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yeah. He was crucified and resurrected after three days. You told me about it. How do you think Jesus was resurrected? Didn't he just get up as if he was waking up in the morning? He was buried after his execution. So his body was in the ground. First time I'm hearing of that, but okay. <laughs> Did he break open the tombstone and crawl out like a zombie? Ah, oh, Brains! Anyway. <laughs> no, 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 no. That wouldn't be called a resurrection. The sinners who killed Jesus imagined exactly the same thing. Jesus predicted just before he was executed that he would come back to life after three days. The sinners buried Jesus, sealed his tomb, and posted guards to watch over it. But what Jesus meant wasn't that he would resurrect physically. He meant his teachings would be re resurrected. Hmm. After three days, Jesus' teachings were resurrected, and people regained their belief. The hearts of those who wanted to be shown the proper way revived his teachings. That's what the resurrection of Jesus is all about. He came back to life in the hearts of his believers. Jesus doesn't exist physically on this earth, but he exists in people's hearts. In other words, that's when Jesus became an existence superior to humans. Even if it's after the author's death. It's weird that it goes in and out, but I actually don't mind it right now, so whatever. それはおじいちゃんが神様になったということ。そうだよ。私の研究はいつか必ず認められるということなんだよ。Sure what the fuck ever. <laughs> その it was very sad to hear my grandfather say that his life would end one day. He wasn't ill, and he didn't only have a few years left to live. But, set next to the average lifespan, his remaining years didn't look like much. The only person left in my life was my grandfather, so I didn't even want to consider what it would be like with him gone. Grandfather must have remembered that I didn't like to talk about that subject. With a tender smile, he gently patted my head. I purposefully didn't mention the before you die part. I caught myself before I said it. Grandfather smiled in satisfaction. His research wasn't exactly outrageous. He wasn't trying to uncover the mysteries of the universe. 
he was only researching the possibility that parasites could be responsible for human behavior. Nothing more than that. Nothing outrageous. It really wasn't a wild idea. We even had some leads. Hinamizawa Village, Shishibone City, XX Prefecture. Damn, does it feel good to say that again. Mmm, Hinamizawa. Oh, damn. It's good to be back, baby. The villagers there are possessed by a powerful homesickness. When they are unable to return, they allegedly behave abnormally, as if they are cursed. There are also some bizarre rules in place in the village, based on their belief system. When he was working with the military during the war, my grandfather noticed similarities between the people in Hinamizawa and assumed that some kind of existence was responsible for their odd behavior. He'd been res uh, researching it even sin ever since then. Sorry. Da. Yeah. Nob. Ah. <laughs> In the middle of the 20th, uh, 20th century, numerous strange diseases were discovered all over Japan. Most of them were caused by infectious um, parasites, and people started to pay attention to this forgotten field of study. Grandfather's research was simply one of those investigations into such diseases. Therefore, he believed it would be published amongst... Uh, other research and attain recognition soon. But if, if his research didn't bear fruit before his death, I wanted to continue it. I wanted to continue his research. Grandfather taught me. Resurrection isn't something that happens physically. It's when your life's work is appreciated. That's what he meant by resurrection. That's when. He'll become a god. So when my grandfather dies, he'll still be with me forever. I wouldn't have to be alone ever again. I will always be with my grandpa. Our works will gain recognition and we will both become gods. Gaining eternal peace. Sure thing there, bud. I will make my grandfather into a god. I will become a god. Therefore, we will be granted eternity. We'll be together forever and ever. Right. <laughs> Whatever. Uh oh. <laughs> I was looking at. The the key on the keychain. The key was labeled henhouse, but the lock Eriko was trying to open didn't belong to that door. It should have opened effortlessly. At least that's what was supposed to happen. But it didn't open. I noticed beads of sweat forming on Eriko's forehead. She was the one who came up with this idea. Eriko was starting to panic. The rest of us started to panic too. This only opens the hen house. Let's stop. Let's go back. Shush. We were supposed to be cleaning out the hen house. If they found us back here, if they found out why we were here and why we were trying to open up the lock to the back door, then all four of us were sure to be sentenced to a splayed piggy. What the f What the fuck? <laughs> Excuse me? Don't panic, Eriko. That key opens this lock, right? You already tried it, right? Will you shut up for a minute? This is the right key. It's just hard to open, that's all. She was almost shrieking. Our hearts were pounding loudly. It was as though the sound of our heartbeats was echoing throughout the hallway. And at that point, we heard footsteps that didn't belong to a child. Shh! Somebody's coming! 
The three of us held our breath, but Eriko didn't hear it. She kept fussing with the lock and the key, as if everything would be okay if she could just open the damn lock. Eriko! God damn it, somebody is coming! Be quiet! I know this is the right key! I'm not dreaming, I already tried it and opened it! Come on, why isn't this working? When this lock is open, we can be happy, and we can say goodbye to this hell! Eriko! Someone's coming! Okay. My father and mother died. I didn't know exactly how old they were. I was too young to remember. They went shopping without me, and that must be why they were punished. It was a train accident. What a terrible disaster. A lot of people died in that instant. But maybe my father was one of the lucky ones. He was still alive when he arrived at the hospital. So he was able to share his final words with me. My mother died instantly. I didn't want to admit th that this person I could hardly recognize was my father. As I called out to him, I hoped that it was someone else instead. But unfortunately, it was my father. Maybe I shouldn't have woken him, because when I woke him up, he was reminded of the miserable agony that he had forgotten. He tried to move his right arm, so he could pat my head, but his arm was wrapped in bandages, and his hand was no longer there. I couldn't find his hand anywhere on the bed. I only had scary memories of his right hand. Its main job was to slap me when I did something bad. Jesus. But I never wished it to be gone. Besides, that hand also patted my head. Even though that only happened a few times, 
It was a big, warm hand, and it stroked my head very gently. But no matter what good deeds I did, he could no longer rub my head. No, his hand was the least of his worries. He had to go into emergency surgery. The doctors already warned me that he, the, uh, the chance of him surviving was very low. That was why I was allowed to see him, regardless of his condition. Not only could he no longer rub my head, he might be gone forever. よく聞きなさい。お父さん。ダメかもしれない。もしもお父さんが死んでもお前はしっかり生きるんだよ。嫌だ嫌だ。お父さんは元気になるよ。お医者様がちゃんと手術してくれるもん。だから死んだりなん
there was no profit to be had in taking in an orphan in the first place. So I thought those civilians who were running orphanages must have been very good people. I was sure they hoped that the children would grow in this loving environment and enter into society with a sense of gratitude. But reality isn't so kind. How many children in this world can actually express their gratitude towards their parents in the first place? Children are supposed to be nurtured by the parents' love. Therefore, when that environment is destroyed, their hearts are wounded. Every child has his or her own personality. Receiving affection doesn't guarantee that a child will become someone angelic. Not everyone's heart can be healed. That was why there were some problem kids at the orphanage. Uh, orphanage. Uh, ah! Words! <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't call them problem kids, though. The sadness and despair of losing their parents, and the anger at having to hide such feelings filled those kids' hearts. Spending time individually with the children could have solved their problems. But at the orphanage where I was, none of the staff members even tried to spend time with them or put in an effort to understand them. All they could do was make sure that the kids followed the rules. Therefore, they could only see the children's emotional pleas for help as problems. In this world, nobody expresses love without expecting something in return. The person who founded that orphanage was expecting something in return as well. He wanted the children to appreciate him. That was why such a faint dream was destroyed by cruel reality. The children called the orphanage a prison, and nobody appreciated the staff at all. In fact, all they did was complain. That made the staff slowly realize that love alone couldn't run a facility like that. Just like how the children called it a prison, the staff started to recognize the facility as a prison too. It was a chain reaction resulting from mistrust on both sides. The staff bound the children with rules so they could suppress problem behavior. There was a framed picture of the founder of this orphanage, but I had never seen him in person. Was he satisfied with the fact that he put his own money into this social service? Or maybe he finally realized his dream of being surrounded by angelic children and being celebrated. What the, what the fuck did I just say? <laughs> celebrated? There we go, for what he did was simply that, a dream. I don't know. But there's one thing I'm certain of. Such a dream didn't exist at the orphanage. There were so many rules and several plausible standards outlined for us. But the most valued one was silence. Children's chatter tends to increase each other's volume, just like mics drawing closer. And sometimes, that leads to fights and the disturbance of order. So children were forbidden from speaking with each other. With those disallowed, they must have thought things would go smoothly. However, I think I always heard people's voices at the orphanage. There were two kinds of voices. One was the staff yelling, and the other was the children crying. We were not allowed to walk around inside of the orphanage freely, so we never knew who it was that was crying. One time, along with the crying and yelling, we heard the noise of metallic things being smashed against each other. We knew it was some kind of punishment, but there was no way for us to even imagine what it was. We trembled, pretended we didn't hear anything, and kept working on our assignments. 
One of my roommates told me it was the casket punishment, but she didn't tell me any further, and I didn't want to know either. Even if we behaved exactly the same way as yesterday, if the staff were in a bad mood, they might pick on us. So, even if I didn't want to know, I might suddenly find out what the casket punishment is one day. The footsteps of a staff member were getting closer. We noticed them, so we straightened our backs and pretended that we were studying hard. It was more important that the staff saw us doing so than us actually getting any work done. I noticed a girl next to me was falling asleep, so I poked her with my elbow. She noticed my signal and straightened her back. Good, good. Like the other children. It was almost evening. This was the hardest time for us to keep ourselves awake, and the most dangerous time. The door to our room opened, and a mean-looking man showed up. Uh-oh. Then he looked around to make sure none of us were falling asleep. Even if we were actually studying hard, if he thought we were asleep, we were out. Oh. That was why we had to make sure we appeared to be studying very hard. Study hard, children. The man walked around our desks. Uh-oh. I hoped he would just walk by me. That was what we all prayed as we kept working on our homework. The more we pretended to study hard, the more we could hear the sound of metal objects. The sound of metal objects crashing into each other, along with screams. That's not good. We couldn't even imagine what the poor subject of that punishment was going through. Maybe there was something even worse than the casket punishment. To erase such fears, we tried to concentrate even harder on our work. We kept working, as the metal sounds and the screams went on forever. I was about to say, for, for, I was about to say further, but nope, I stopped. <laughs> Actually, that would probably be one of the better words to use there, but eh, whatever. Uh, the only time we were allowed to exchange words with our roommates was right after turning the lights off to go to bed. Being located in the middle of the mountains, the orphanage was very quiet at night. After making sure the staff members were far, uh, far away enough from our room, we enjoyed talking amongst ourselves. That was the only leisure time allowed to us, though it wasn't anything nice like enjoying pleasant conversation. Why? because we mostly talked about others behind their backs. Of course you would, your kids. <laughs> kids are mean, no matter the situation. Uh, we spoke of things like that member of staff is only strict or unfair or malicious towards this person and so on. We just repeated those topics forever until someone couldn't keep themselves awake anymore. We even discussed how we could get back at the staff and we took revenge on all of them in our imagination. Some kids even started to cry when talking about it, difficult as it was for us. Although the subjects we spoke of were negative, talking about them was the only way to vent our frustrations, and even though we felt despair about tomorrow, we were able to fall asleep. But sometimes, a different subject popped up. It was about... How the fuck am I going to say this? <laughs> I'm going to try my best, but please don't hurt me. It was about the Yurigawa... Go... Ah! God damn it! Yurigawaka. There we go. I think I got it. Maybe not. Sue me. House of Love and Mercy on the other side of the river. Oh. I kind of don't like this music. It creeps me the fuck out. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Over there, I hear they got not only nap time, but snack time too. Plus, the president is a very nice person. The House of Love and Mercy was a privately run orphanage. Oh, really? 
just like the one I was at. But it was a very kind facility unlike ours. It seemed like a fantasy land compared to our current environment. A few years before, when this place was a lot worse, a few children tried to escape. Oof. It was hard to believe. There was a time when this orphanage was even worse to live at. Supposedly, three or four people tried to escape. I don't know the exact number, though. They headed to the House of Love and Mercy. Their escape was a success. Except for one unlucky child, they were able to get to the property of the, uh, the House of Love and Mercy. I guess the staff couldn't follow them into the other orphanage's property. Hmm. In other words, the other facility's property had to be out of their jurisdiction. Huh. Okay. The staff were frustrated that kids got away from them. And they dragged the one they caught back here. I'm sure they wanted to bring back the others who got away from them too. I'm certain the staff were determined not to let the single one escape. It was easy to see that determination in the obstinate way they locked the place up after that event. Hmm. But they were never able to bring back the ones that got away. No matter how much the staff were mortified, they couldn't reclaim the children and punish them. In other words, if you could make it to the House of Love and Mercy, then you could escape the evil clutches of this hell. On the other hand, the one they caught went through such misery afterwards. Yet the exact details of how he was punished were never passed down. All that remained were ominous phrases left by those who knew him at the time. The drowned ducky, the mashed caterpillar, the splayed piggy. Uh, hearing that one again, huh? I can't even imagine what kind of punishments they were. The only thing I can say is that those punishments were supposed to be far more harsh than the casket punishment. Which was the most cruel punishment I knew at the time. I can only imagine how horrible those punishments were from their ominous names. After that, the captured kid's wish came true and he was able to leave the orphanage. Was he able to leave this orphanage safely and enjoy his freedom while breathing in fresh air under the blue sky? I highly doubt that. Um, I think he earned his uh, freedom by dying. Because <laughs> uh, whatever the splayed picky is sounds <laughs> horrible. I can't imagine what it is. It's something that will get you killed. <laughs> this kid died. Oh my god, the names of these fucking things. What the fuck is wrong with this place, man? Well, according to the rumors, that wasn't what happened at all. Oh? While he was playing in the boiler room, he slipped and fell, injured his brain, and died. Well, I was right, folks. He died. It's just how he died is blurry. <laughs> the children were instructed not to go into the boiler room after that incident. Everyone knew the boiler room was always locked. So everyone knew he was killed. And not just like that. He was killed after being tortured. He was killed to teach the other children that they would face hell on earth if they tried to escape. Yet to those who faced the risk and made it out obtained ordinary average lives full of love and mercy's namesake, which were far better conditions than we lived in here. Maybe the house of love and misery was really heaven. Maybe all the orphanages were pretty much the same. But compared to my orphanage, 
I bet anything else would have been better. Even if someone escaped successfully, the police would catch them. Then he'd be sent back to the orphanage, which would be pretty much the same as being killed. However, if he could reach the House of Love and Misery, they'd take him in. They wouldn't send him back. By talking about escaping to the House of Love and Misery, I hate repeating that fucking place so fucking much. Please stop. <laughs> Fuck. We were trying to forget how cruel reality was to us. Then one day, the leader of our group, Erigo, said to us quietly, Would you try to escape if you had a chance to? Who didn't want to escape from here? It was a rather foolish question, but that wasn't what she meant. If there was a chance to escape, would you take that chance, knowing what you had to go through if you got caught? That was what she meant. Not one of us could answer immediately. If the previous escape incident was a total success, then we might have thought differently. But after that, the orphanage had tightened up security to prevent runaways. All the doors and windows were locked heavily, and it wouldn't be at all easy to get out. Even if another group escape was planned, the success rate would be very low. Three escaped and one was caught before. Maybe two would be caught next time. No, maybe everyone would be. If I could, I'd want to escape. But the House of Love and Mil- Ah! <laughs> I told you, I was gonna go crazy! Anyway, sorry. But the House of Love and Mercy is so far away. The bridge is long too. We'll all be caught before we get there. Besides, we can't even go outside. Everything is locked up. There were locks all over the orphanage. To escape, you'd need a key for both the inside and the outside, and after the lights were turned off, even each section of the hallway was individually locked. Make no mistake, this was a prison. According to the rumors, orphanages receive government funding depending on the number of children they house. So, if anyone escapes, they lose money. Also, if we were to expose the conditions at the orphanage, they would end up being inspected, and things would get complicated for them. That was why they were so intent on keeping us locked up. Uh, locked up. Sure, if there was a chance I'd want to escape, but realistically, there's no way we could. Every door is locked. Well, did you know? The hen house in the courtyard uses the same key as the door to the back stairs. Eh? Really? Shh. Ergo shushed us. Sometimes mass-produced locks take the same key. Of course, most places use different types of locks so that this won't happen. But the staff at the orphanage must have overlooked it. So there were two locks that used the same key at the orphanage. However, most of us never had a chance to even touch the keys. But there were a few exceptions. One of those was the hen house. Each room and group took turns taking care of different chores. If your group was assigned to clean the hen house, you'd have to get the key to it from the teacher's office. You were supposed to return the key immediately after you were done. But, while taking care of the hen house, the key was in the children's hands. While the staff would occasionally come around to check, they couldn't keep an eye on us forever. eriko chan you aren't thinking about using that key, are you? L let's not. It's too dangerous. Of course it's dangerous if there's only one of us. But it's different if we're in a group. Wait, why? Do you know why only one kid was caught in the last time they tried to escape? They were desperate. And so to escape as a group, they did something to increase the chance of success. That was why only one of them was caught. What did they do? 
They scattered as they ran. They dashed in different directions. They waited until the day when there were only a few people working at the orphanage and ran this way and that. And so, although it all depended on luck, it would increase the chances of success for sure. On your own, you'd probably have no hope, but if the staff were to chase after other children, then your own chance of escaping successfully would increase. In other words, Ergo was inviting us to escape with her. The more children joined, the more each of our chances would increase. But among us, there were children who tattled to the staff for their own benefit. So she had to be very careful about who she talked to. Ergo must have trusted us a lot. Ergo, me, Totomai, and Kikuku. K I can't fucking pronounce these names. Kikuko. There we go. Four children. Do any of you want to stay here a day longer? The three of us shook our heads. Well, of course you wouldn't. <laughs> But at the same time, we couldn't agree to escape with her either. Of course we don't want to stay here a day longer, or even an hour longer. Even if we did exactly the same thing as we did yesterday, we might get yelled at tomorrow. I can't stand this anymore. I can't stand living in fear of what to do and what not to do, so I won't be yelled at. We all feel the same way. We could endure strict rules but it was almost impossible to endure vague ones. It wasn't too much of a stretch to say that the rules depended on the mood of the staff. This is okay. That isn't okay. Such borderline rules changed daily. And if we were to say anything about that, we would be treated horribly for it. I will escape, even if I have to do it alone. Like I said, the more people that join, the better our chance. Think about it. If they find out about this henhouse key trick, they are sure to change the lock on the back door. In other words, we only have one chance. So even if you regret not joining in later, it'll be too late. But, uh-oh. I'm scared. I'm scared too. If we get caught, we'll be killed. Ah, <sighs> Totomai and K Kikuko. Kikuko. There we go. Okay. Wasn't the only ones who felt that, uh, felt afraid. The fear was perfectly understandable. Because all of a sudden, the fear of the punishment that would follow had become very realistic. I'm sure Eriko felt the same way too. But her courage was suppressing her fear. And because of that, she shared her idea with us. So, do you plan to stay here forever? No, 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 no way! I know you are scared, but this is the only chance we have. You have to be brave just this once. What about you, Miyoko? Don't you want to go with me? Unlike Tatamai and Kikuko, I know you're supposed to say it fast, and I'm stretching it out by saying it, by saying it slowly, but I need to pronounce these right, man. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, I'm ranting. I wasn't trembling too much. Of course, I was scared in my own way, but compared to the other two, I must have appeared rather calm. Can we really escape? Of course, Iroko couldn't guarantee our success, but I had to ask her anyway. There's no guarantee. But if you join me, I'll have a better chance of escaping than trying to run on my own. Of course, the same goes for you too. Iroko gave a calculated reason, but I'm sure she just wanted a friend to agree with her. That was probably more important to her than increasing her chances to escape. The Tomai. Kikukuko. <laughs> I think I added another. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you're too scared, then I won't force you. 
Miyoko and I will escape ourselves. Two is enough. Ah, uh, well... Eriko rushed to the two to make up their minds. It almost looked cold, but that was her way of mustering their courage. Because it was very possible that, regardless of the outcome of our escape attempt, as our roommates, those two would be held responsible. Oh, that's very true. If those two try to escape, whether they succeed or not, then the two who didn't attempt it would still be held responsible. Right? It's just how it goes, man. It's... <laughs> uh, I wouldn't agree with it, but... Uh, well... Whatever. <laughs> it's not like we'll do it tomorrow. Our turn to take care of the hen house is in a week. We'll have... We'll wait for the perfect time to do it. If we don't feel that it's safe, then we'll wait until our next turn. We'll be very careful. The rotation of the staff and the timing were important, but we also each had to know the way to the house of love and mercy. We were planning to split up, so we had to know the area. I made up my mind. Okay. I'm coming with you. But let's time our escape very carefully, okay? Of course. We'll be killed if we get caught. I don't want to die. I, I, I'll come too. Me too, me too. Ah, <sighs> Totomai and Kikuko agreed. And we all, and so we all, decided to escape as a group. We waited for the perfect opportunity. We waited for the day where only a few staff members were at the orphanage. And we decided to let God take care of the rest. Okay. No line there, huh? Ah, it's open! Maybe it was the way I did it. Erico tried to open the lock several times without success. Uh, what the fuck? Without success. But I got it to open on the first attempt. The back door opened slowly, and we felt a cool breeze. This wasn't the, uh, the world of freedom just yet. In fact, it was the exact opposite. If the staff were to find out we were here, we would be in big trouble. It was a world of danger. But unless we went through that dangerous world, we wouldn't be able to go any further. Yes. Go. I think... Erika wanted to say that. We were planning to leave with that as our cue. But what we heard instead wasn't Erika's voice. We started to run. It was raining. We all got soaked immediately, and our clothes stuck to our skin. While that would normally be very uncomfortable, we couldn't even stop to think about that. We could only keep running in the rain. We were dashing on gravel, but it felt more like trudging through a muddy rice field. My feet kept sinking, and I couldn't pull them up. I was frustrated because no matter how fast I tried to run, I wasn't gaining any speed. I felt a sense of urgency. I heard someone yelling, escape, behind me, and all I could do was run like crazy. <laughs> With Eriko's cue, we all went to different ways, hoping that they wouldn't be coming after us. Would we be able to reunite safely at the House of Love and Mercy? All four of us there together, or maybe someone would be missing. No, maybe everyone else would make it and I'd be the only one who gets caught. My thoughts were interrupted by the voice of a staff member coming from behind me. The staff members should have numbered fewer than us. So if I was lucky, they wouldn't be coming after me. Praying that the staff voices I heard in the distance weren't after me, I looked back for a moment. If I had time to turn around, why didn't I take another step forward? Why didn't I try to escape further? 
As I turned around, I felt a huge hand cover my face. Its pinky finger slipped into my open mouth. Yuck. The hand grabbing my face shoved me into the muddy gravel. Of course, I didn't stay quiet. I fought back, and then I saw his face. It was the scariest face I've ever seen. I realized it immediately. He only wanted to capture me alive to use me as an example. And considering what would happen to me afterwards, killing me here on the spot wouldn't pose any problem, would it? Yes, he looked at me with unworldly hate, ready to end my life here and now. His pinky finger ended up touching my tongue. The indescribably nasty taste sent an icky feeling throughout my whole body. Ah, uh, that's it. This is what my murder tastes like. What? <laughs> Wait, what? Excuse me? He was going to shove that finger down my windpipe and suffocate me. I don't think a pinky finger can do that, baby girl. I, do, I, I don't think a pinky finger can do that. Uh, and so in order to live, I fought back in the only way I could. Oh, don't say you're going to bite down on that finger. Oh, God, that hurts. I mean, you got to do it to to survive and all, but still, oh, my God, just thinking about it. Oh, anyway, sorry. What? Uh, what? What do you mean? Mm. <laughs> okay. Sound effects. Got it. Something warm filled my mouth. Yep. She, she, she bit the pinky off. That, that, that's great. <laughs> oh, no. It felt like swallowing blood after a nosebleed. I spit it from my mouth and ran without turning around, leaving behind a staff member clutching his pinky finger. Yay! Oh. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I heard his roars echoing behind me. It wasn't a man that was after me. It was a beast. Oh my god. <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude. Take a chill pill, why don't you? 31 minutes already? Okay, what? Uh, yes. He had no interest in capturing me. His only goal was to see me dead. My shoes had slipped off. They weren't sneakers. So they came off easily while I was running like mad. Okay. My bare feet struck the gravel over and over. It was painful, but I didn't care. Because if I stopped, I knew what would happen to me. Oh. Uh. Tree branches cut my face and barbed wires uh, scratched my thighs. Jesus Christ. My feet and toes were bloody from running on gravel. The blood from the staff member's pink, uh, pinky fingers stripped down my mouth, staining my chest and chin. I was running from... Uh, uh, what the fuck is happening? I can't read words anymore. <laughs> I was running for my life with scratches and cuts all over my body. If I were to get caught, I would be killed. If my pursuer had any sense, then I would be killed after being tortured. But if he didn't, I would be killed on the spot. I don't want to be killed. I don't want to be killed. My lungs and heart were about to explode. My mind was blank from fear and the lack of oxygen. I was about to lose consciousness. I might have given in if I didn't hear the voice of a staff member coming after me. My knees were shaking. My legs wouldn't move properly. I felt like I was going to fall like a puppet with its strings cut. But I couldn't fall. I couldn't fall just yet. Ah. It was too late. My face had hit the gravel. I felt the awful sensation of falling. And immediately after, the roar of the beast coming from behind me. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Dude, take a chill pill. <laughs> oh. Oh. Ah. Ah. Okay. I'm done. I'm sorry. 
I must have hit my thigh against the steering wheel when I jumped. I could feel the throbbing pain delayed slightly. I'm sweating all over. I wiped the sweat from my forehead and put my hand on my chest, only then realizing how fast my heart was beating. I rubbed my thigh. I rubbed it in a straight line. That's not where I hit the steering wheel. But I feel like this is where it hurts. Yeah, she's remembering her past. She had a nightmare about the past. Oh my god. I can't see a scary beast in the moonlit car. I have my shoes on, and I'm not covered in blood. My toes are fine, too. Someone knocked on the window, startling me. Sansa, time is I wanted to take a nap, so I told him to come wake me up in an hour. Maybe an hour was too long. Too long a nap n uh, actually makes you tired. Does it really, though? Meh. I put my seat back up and got out of the car. The cool breeze feels good on my skin. I only see the moon. There's nothing else to see on this mountain trail. My car and a command vehicle disguised as a trailer are parked on the side of the street. I can still feel that bad taste in my mouth. I spat it out on the side of the street. But even that couldn't get rid of it. The taste of blood, saliva, and rain. Sweat from my forehead and raindrops got into my mouth, but I couldn't swallow, so I ended up drooling. That sensation around my lips brought back memories, and I tried to wipe my mouth. Maybe I'm nervous. That's why I had such a bad dream. I think there's a coffee machine in the command vehicle. An unpleasant cup of coffee will wake me up. どう I still have a bad taste in my mouth. The feeling of biting and crushing his little finger and his filthy blood filling up my mouth. I'm sure a sweeter cup of coffee will wash down that bad taste and also wake me up from my nightmare completely. There we go. All right. All right, no new tips from what I, uh, right? Or are they just, okay, yeah, there was no new tip. Okay, that's fine. Um, so, hope you all enjoyed that chapter one. I wasn't really expecting to see her backstory, but of course we're going to, as this is the final chapter of Higurashi. Whew. All right. I, some of that was covered in the anime, was it? Or was it not? I remember some pieces of that, but others I did not, which is weird. I don't know. Hmm. Anyway. <laughs> it, I'll say this. Coming back into Higurashi with the final chapter here, uh, chapter 8, and... Um, Reading up this first chapter here. Hmm. It was good. I mean, I don't like her. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> For obvious reasons. But still, that was that was a good backstory, right? You have to agree on that, at least. Get a little filler backstory here and there, you know? Pretty interesting. 
it was kind of gruesome with the whole uh, orphanage ordeal and, you know, kids disappearing. <laughs> Wink. <laughs> uh, but it was good. And I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I did put up a voting poll on my Twitter account. So if you haven't checked that out, go ahead and do so. Um, so far at the current moment that I'm recording this, I think longer videos are winning. So that means two videos a week. That means one video of Higurashi and one video of Umineko a week. Um, hopefully some of you are okay with that to no matter the outcome of the voting. I kind of agree with that. It helps me record in parts. And then I put all those parts together while editing and boom. Everything just comes out neatly. I did screw up a little bit. But that's because I was nervous because, well, <laughs> I c I'm coming back into the final chapter of Higurashi. Of course, I'm going to be a little bit nervous. But, uh, yeah, that was, uh, huh. That was good. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a like, share the video, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already because there will be more Higurashi and Umineko coming soon. So stay in tune for that, and until next time, please, as a reminder, stay sinful, folks! <laughs>